so pleased. Uh, I think Boris Johnson really thought he was Palmerston uh, and that he was going to uh, be Palmerston or Churchill, but pr probably Palmerston. Uh, and this is the kind of complete mess that we're in. This is quite bad for the European economy, in my view, and Europe, I think, has misunderstood or whatever, has sided with the U.S. approach in a way that makes no sense from the European economy and that is quite destructive of the European economy. And the most uh, vigorous of this, not the most, in, you know, uh, gung-ho, which is definitely the Baltic states and Poland, but the the key to this is Germany, and Germany is by far the biggest economic loser of this whole operation. And I think the costs are quite long term and serious for Germany, and unless the war ends quickly. So just to finish that thought, my view continues to be that the war should end through negotiations, and the negotiations should have three parts to them. No NATO enlargement. Crimea remains de facto in Russian hands. And something is done about the Donbass. I don't know what. Maybe it's too late. Uh, but rather than reducing it to rubble, it would be better to have even a frozen conflict, if not a full negotiated outcome. I believe that this is possible, and I believe the United States neoconservatives still reject it because they are still after victory, but I don't think victory is coming on the battlefield. And I think the costs for Europe are very, very high and the costs for the world are quite high. So this is the, the next supply shock. So what to do about supply shocks? First, the main lesson is central banks cannot fix supply shocks. Sorry to say. Central banks can keep financial systems from imploding. Central banks can be lenders of last resort. Central banks can maintain liquidity. Central banks can maintain monetary stability. But central banks cannot fix supply shocks. Supply shocks are real economy shocks, and they cannot be cured by central banks. So the only way to address supply shocks macroeconomically is through addressing the shocks themselves. You end the pandemic, stop the war, and build resilience to the climate change. It's the only way. It's a lot harder than finding some kind of macroeconomic instrument but because it is a real economy shock, it can't be solved by an aggregate demand instrument or a financial instrument per se. Oh, but that means hard work by governments. Uh, and that is what our governments are not so great at in general, uh, especially I'll say my own. Uh, it's what we really need to do is understand the shocks and face them as the uh, as the the way to proceed. I'll close these meandering remarks with some words about sustainability, about the environmental side of the story, just quickly. In all of this mess, one piece is, of course, the human-induced climate change. It's one of five or 10 major challenges. It's not the only one, but it's big and it's very serious. And I had the honor and a great but deeply unpleasant experience of guiding an institute of several hundred climate scientists for 15 years at Columbia University. And it was unpleasant because they're wonderful people who scare the daylights out of you because they quietly come up to you and say, the world is over. Uh, 
and uh, they do it in a very convincing way with statistics and computer simulation models and, uh, and uh, brilliant science that you can't argue with. And my most terrifying colleague is a wonderful gentleman, James Hansen, who was the chief scientist, climate scientist of NASA for 30 years and is a professor at Columbia. He's absolutely brilliant. And not a month went by in 15 years where he didn't say to me, Jeff, it's worse than we thought. Uh, in other words, it's accelerating faster. The ice sheets are being destroyed faster. The thermal hailing circulation is slowing faster. The uh, aerosol uh, masking of climate change is uh, diminishing faster. He's really afraid. And my advice to you is if James Hansen's afraid of it, you should be afraid of it too. This is very real and it's extremely serious. And one of the issues of the human, uh, of our environment is that it's a highly nonlinear system. And so the idea of tipping points is a real, a real thing. We have phase changes in nature. You go a little bit warmer, you go from ice to liquid. You go a little bit warmer, the West Antarctic ice sheet disintegrates, as an example, or the permafrost melts, or the ocean circulation stops or slows decisively. All of these things are happening right now. All these tipping points are in process. We don't know exactly what the thresholds, and when I say we, I mean James Hansen doesn't, because I don't know anything that he doesn't know. Um, but he says they're close. So on that score, there are two major things to do. One is to mitigate the human uh, forcings, and that means dramatically reducing the greenhouse emissions. And the second is adaptation, which means living with the warming that's going to go on for the next century or more. Because even if we stop all emissions now, the warming continues for decades to come because the Earth has not yet reached thermal equilibrium with the emissions that we've already done because it takes decades for the oceans to warm. And so the oceans are still absorbing huge amounts of net energy flux coming from the greenhouse emissions we already have. And as the oceans warm, the overall Earth system warms, and that process is going to go on for another century, no matter what the emissions we have. So this is quite serious. And on the mitigation side, of course, the center of the mitigation is a zero carbon energy system and ending the net emissions from nature from deforestation and from the farm system. So that's a lot to talk about and I won't say too much about it and I'm sure many of you know a lot about it, but we do need to decarbonize the energy system. In this regard, Hungary is relatively better placed than a lot of other countries because you are already substantially zero, not 50% and rising zero carbon electricity, which is the key. And building more of the nuclear power, to my mind, is the right choice, as long as you take care that it's safe. Uh, but it's a, it, it, is a, uh, it, it, it is a right choice. Of course, it should be augmented with other renewables and what Prime Minister Orban has been saying, that it needs to be part of a multi-country transmission system is really important because there is no way for any single country to have a zero carbon resilient energy system. It must be part of a network that is broader and that has more uh, points of uh, distribution of these intermittent energy sources You'll have base energy, but others on wind and solar and so forth need a distributed system. This, to my mind, is another reason why the destruction of Nord Stream was so awful. 
because we need cross-border trade in energy. Of course, the gas would have had to diminish over time and probably be replaced by hydrogen in the pipeline. And that's probably what would have happened over time. But the idea, the U.S. new idea is that trade, they call it dependency. Europe shouldn't be dependent on Russia. This is stupid, actually. Europe shouldn't, it's mainly saying Europe shouldn't trade with Russia. Of course, there should be mutual dependency. It's called international trade. But now we're in a mood of we need self-sufficiency. We need everything at home. You cannot have green systems in autarkic environment. We need transmission across national boundaries, even for gas. And the idea that this was some fatal mistake of Germany to enter into dependency on Russia is just a ridiculous American idea, by the way. Not an American idea, American strategist's idea. Because they're viewing the world not in terms of uh, sustainability or economic well-being, but in terms of who's up and who's down. A zero-sum vision of the world, not a actual economic vision of the world. Because in economics, we don't have the concept of dependency on imports. We have the concept of trade, which is mutually beneficial. So we are going to need a grid. And uh, I hope that Hungary really promotes a broad grid. It should, by the way, in the end, once this war is over, sooner rather than later, include Russia again. Uh, it should build out wind in the Black Sea region, which is absolutely plentiful and a massive investment. It should actually integrate also with North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean, which have huge amounts of sunshine. So that is not the central bank's main function, except to say to the government, that's your function. <laughs> Uh, and that's uh, what really needs to be done. You can help to facilitate a financial system which supports these transformations, which measures the risks of not doing this, which takes into account the shocks that will come in a system that either economically or in a regulatory way or in an environmental way proves to be unsustainable. But this is really where we need our governments to stop the wars and start the cooperation. Thank you very much.